Leanne and I invested over three years in youth ministry. I had more hair when I started. In fact, I remember a few times adopting the classic pose of gripping what was left and saying, grrr, but actually most of the time I really enjoyed it. And I think I had it pretty easy. I mean, my boys would come in, they'd eat everything in the house, they'd leave their soda cans on my bookshelves. They would come in without knocking at all hours. I kept telling them, I am married now, this could lead to a bad thing. My wife will beat you, you know. They put holes in my walls. They sometimes bragged about their sins until I smacked them, and they risked my standing with our insurance company by doing spectacular skateboarding tricks off the bed of my pickup truck. But, as I say, I had it easy, because with Leanne's girls group, we had social cliques, depression, attempted suicide, statutory rape, drug use, arrests, and homelessness. Youth ministry can be a lot of work. I had it easy. But you know, whether easy or hard, it's definitely worth it. If you're feeling God tug on you, that maybe you want to be involved in one of our youth ministries, pray about it, come talk to me. We can put you in a safe environment, give you a chance to get used to it. It was really rewarding. One year, our youth pastor asked us a defining question. How did we want the teenagers to remember us 20 years from now? And I decided I wanted them to remember that I found answers to life's problems in the Bible, that whatever issue they brought to the group, I pointed them to Scripture. And you know what? It's now been 20 years, and nothing has changed. That's how I'd like you to remember me 20 years from now. If you want to be spiritually healthy and growing, if you, if you want to know God well, you have to have regular time in God's Word. There's just no way around it. Today, I want to revisit that theme, encouraging you to think about one key verse or key passage every day for a week. You can do that. This is easy. Let's take a look at a passage that is useful for our purposes. Well, that's interesting. Oh, it's only on my screen. It's flickering. Yours is good. All right. I was just a little worried that we were going to send some of you into epileptic shock or something. This is uh, Psalm 119, verses 15 and 16. It says, I will meditate on your precepts and think about your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Now, what does the Bible mean about meditation? I mean, does God want you to become a Buddhist? Are you supposed to go home, sit down, somehow get your feet up on top of your thighs, spread your hands, empty your mind, and say, Om, Om. Is that what God wants? No. Can you say that with me? I want to make sure you got that. No. Try again. No. Okay. Hopefully the camera picked you up. You were in agreement. No, that's not what God wants. Actually, the problem is our minds are empty already. Oh, I know, they're full of stuff, right? But what kind of stuff? Schedules, song lyrics, sports, statistics, procedures from our workplace. And what are we most diligent about packing into our minds? Mindless drivel and harmful, corrupting influences from television, movies, rock stars, video games. Our minds are full of stuff, but it might be empty of what we most need. Christian meditation is totally different from Buddhist meditation anyway. Buddhists try to empty their minds, and that might not be a totally bad thing given what some of us have packed in there, right? But we know we can't leave our minds empty because something worse will come in. So we try to fill our minds with God's truth, with goodness, specifically the Word of God. So because of the way our culture is right now in all this New Age stuff, for clarity, I like to say reflection instead of meditation. So I suggest you reflect on what God has revealed in Scripture so that you can fill your mind with scriptural truth. The psalmist says he will reflect on God's precepts, God's instructions, and he elaborates to say he will think about God's ways. 
we too should reflect on God's instructions and everything else in the Bible, right? Because it's all from God. It's all good and useful. The psalmist also says he will not forget God's word. I would like to suggest that reflection and memorization go well together. If you were to reflect seriously on one verse for several days, you would know it. You'd know what it said. You would have, in effect, have memorized it. And if you memorize a verse, then you can much more easily think about it during the day when you are away from your Bible. When I started my first pastorate at a Bible church, I did a survey of them. And I found that only about a third of them were working on reflecting or memorizing when it came to Scripture. So even in a Bible church, we need convincing that there's some reason we should do this. You know, we give the children incentives to memorize Scripture. If they go to Berean, then they can earn a better grade. If they come to Awana, then they can earn points, which they later can redeem for awards or prizes. In Pennsylvania, we used to let them earn a chance for ice cream with the pastor, which was a lot of fun, for me, anyway. Hey, somebody took me up on it. Well, today I want to give you a different kind of incentive, one that comes directly from God instead of from my wallet. So let's take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says, You have known the holy writings, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Every scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the person dedicated to God may be capable and equipped for every good work. Scripture is inspired by God. Do you ever think about that? I mean, you have something God-inspired. That's like he wrote it himself. Would you like to know what mattered so much to God that he had someone write it down? Reading the Bible will allow you to hear what God wants you to know. Scripture allows us to know God, shows us the way of salvation, shows us how to live godly lives, and shows us how to become equipped for the work that God has planned for us. Scripture helps us take growth steps so we end up closer to God, walking in His light, following Christ. And Scripture shows us the error if we get off track. So I hope you agree that Scripture is a valuable resource. We should be able to see that we could benefit greatly from some time spent in it. So what if we don't spend time in it? Well, then we're not going to understand God as well because we're not listening to Him. So we'll have trouble relating to Him and we'll have trouble discerning the Holy Spirit's voice from all the other voices in our head. We're going to struggle in that case to live in God's light often straying into the shadows. And that means we'll be turning away from God, following the path of Satan, disqualifying ourselves from many of the blessings inherent in God's way of life. We will not remain spiritually healthy, we won't grow spiritually as much, and thus we won't be prepared to do the work God wants us to do. So do you think there's an incentive for us here to spend time in God's Word? If you do, you'll be blessed. If you neglect it, then you will suffer. The carrot and the stick. Here's another verse with another good incentive. Romans 15, verse 4. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Now, how many of us have struggled in life so far? All of us, right? We all experience heartbreak, lose jobs, struggle to pay some of our bills at times, have injuries and illnesses, worry about our loved ones, and on and on. It's a struggle in this life. Well, Scripture can give us hope and encouragement. Many life issues are discussed directly in the Bible. But even if you're dealing with an issue, a struggle that's not mentioned in the Bible, Scripture can still give you hope and encouragement. And to me, that's a very valuable incentive. Psalm 1 
is a great passage for reflecting upon. It begins like this. Blessed is the man or person who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates or reflects day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Now I mentioned earlier there were many voices in your head. I wasn't trying to suggest we all have the same psychiatric issues. I think we probably all have a psychiatric issue, but I don't think it's all the same one, right? What I meant was there are many sources of ideas that come into our brains and influence what we think. The Bible says demons can influence our thoughts, but even when they're leaving us alone, we still have our own corrupted flesh, our flawed upbringing, the damaging prior experiences we've been through. And just think about the wider cultural influence that comes into our brains through the media, our peers at work or school, our family, our friends. You know, I have a graduate degree in economics, so I can tell you with regard to economics that a lot of what you read, hear, or even perceive contains error. I used to delight my students by teaching them very simple economic concepts that could benefit their lives, but which shocked their way of thinking. I delighted in teaching them simple economic concepts that showed that the government quite often makes the wrong economic decision. Spiritually, we have something similar going on. You know, one of the cool things about the Bible is that it not only shows you the way of God and what happens to a person who starts walking that way, following Jesus, staying in the light with Christ. It also shows us what happens in the way of the world, if you're following what is socially accepted in their reasoning, what happens to the person who goes down that path? All this information can bolster your insight, your discretion, your discernment. It helps you keep from being deceived by all those wrong influences that might be coming into your mind. Think about how much time you spend in an average day watching secular video. Could be YouTube, could be television. I'm going to watch football later. I'm not saying it's wrong or sinful. Just how much time do you spend with secular video? Now add the amount of time you spend just reading things on the internet or playing video games. And now add to that the amount of time listening to secular music and reading secular secular literature. And now add the amount of time that you spend in discussion with unchurched people. This probably adds up to a lot for most of us, right? Especially if you work outside the home or go to public school. Now compare the number of hours on the average day that you're listening to the world to the amount of time you're spending in the average day listening to God through his biblical revelation. If you don't read the Bible at all, you have an infinite ratio, which is as big and bad as it can get, right? Others of you will have a ratio of something like 200 to 1. Even if you study 15 minutes every morning in the Bible, if you have 12 hours out in the world, that's a 48 to 1 ratio. So, given what your ratio is likely to be, what's more likely to influence you? Is it going to be the world and its reasoning or God's revelation? Are you setting yourself up to be deceived or to be discerning. Now listen. God's word is powerful. That's where Ken would say amen, amen, amen. Ken, if you're watching, we hope you get better soon. You don't need to spend the whole day in the Bible. You don't need to bring your ratio down to one to one to be safe. But trust me, some time, some daily time in God's word will benefit you greatly. Let's take a look at Joshua 1.8. It says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate or reflect on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. 
Those were among the first words God spoke to Joshua when Joshua took over the nation of Israel from Moses. Why? Why was it so important for Joshua to reflect on Scripture day and night? Why was it so important that he could speak scriptural truth to himself at all times in all situations? Well, suppose you memorized some key passages of Scripture and reflected on their meaning and application for life. How could that be useful to you, do you think? One way, as I mentioned earlier, is knowing Scripture well helps us be discerning in situations to stay walking in God's light. Another way is that when you are tempted, the Holy Spirit can bring a memorized verse to your mind to strengthen you and guide you away from falling into sin. When I was doing ministry with high school boys, I had them memorize a very key passage for them. This is in Matthew 5. Jesus says, You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So a couple of weeks later, one of these young men came to me and said I was ruining his teenage life because he had been at the gym working out and there was this gorgeous girl there in this tight-fitting bodysuit and the Holy Spirit brought this passage to his mind so strongly that he couldn't even look at her. You know what I said? Praise God! That was the point. The Holy Spirit will bring to mind memorized scripture in our time of need so that we can resist temptation. Another kind of need, as we mentioned, is encouragement or hope. Another kind is to fight deception. If you feel despair or you hear in your head that you are worthless or nobody loves you or you should be ashamed, or maybe the other way that you have a right to be happy no matter what that means, what it takes, you have a right to cheat on your spouse, or a right to go and take revenge on people who have hurt you. Well, the Holy Spirit can empower you to take those thoughts captive in the name of Jesus Christ and counter them with memorized biblical truth. If someone says Jesus had a wife, or Noah consulted magicians who fed him hallucinogenic drugs, well... The Holy Spirit can bring scriptural truth to your mind so you're not deceived. Now, I heard some of you laugh. You might laugh or snort at such examples, but you know what? Those were actually promoted in the secular press within the last 10 years. And people, even Christian, even church-going people, fall for these things and way more subtle deceptions all the time, every day. (laughs) So, we have to absorb scripture into our minds so that we can counter these lies and stay walking with God. Let's take another look at a, I mean, a look at a similar passage in mind, Deuteronomy chapter 6. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Now, I mentioned earlier that Scripture equips us for ministry, right? Well, if you have a family, your number one ministry priority is not the church. It's helping your family develop a healthy relationship and walk with God. Look at this picture. I don't know, you probably can't see it. Maybe you can. The dad had a sore back. So being who he is, My good friend Ray, instead of stopping playing video games, he simply got a pillow and put it behind his back. His two-year-old son, seeing that, went and got a pillow and put it behind his back, right? Our children will imitate the parents no matter what we say. These things are caught more than they're taught. So you need to absorb Scripture so well that you could say it is on your heart. Why? Because you cannot impress scripture on your children. You cannot teach them biblical principles. You cannot convince them that the word has any value if you are not learning it and benefiting from it yourself. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Because I'll tell you the biggest deterrent for our children and our teenagers coming to true faith and a true walk with God is their parents. 
who say they believe and never live it out. I'm not saying that applies to all of you, but I'm telling you from years and years in children's ministry, youth ministry, and the pastorate, and you can pick up books on the subject, talk to any other pastor. Parents who say they believe and don't live it out, the kids see no reason to believe it's real. And that's true if you want to influence your friends, your coworkers, your schoolmates, your neighbors, or anyone else. Only if you take God's word seriously yourself can you convince them and minister to them using it. That two-year-old in the picture, Matthew, he could recite the gospel at that age. Now, I'm not saying he understood it all, but he knew it. And that's because his parents were impressing Scripture upon him as they studied in God's word every single day. A few years later, we knew his faith was real and he was baptized. And now he lives in Papua New Guinea. He's an active missionary kid with his parents there. So I've invested 15 minutes trying to convince you about this. I hope you see that some time in God's Word could lead to great blessings, especially if you reflect on God's Word, if you memorize God's Word. So the next question has to be, can you do this? Let's take a look at this comic. I'll read it to you in case you can't see it. In the first panel, the father says, I heard a tune on the elevator that we used to sing at Camp Wanamichi as kids. In the second panel, the dad says, and then I realized that not only could I recall all 12 verses of that song, I could also remember the theme songs from all of my favorite TV shows. Isn't that amazing? In the third panel, the mother says, and yet he's still surprised when I remind him that brown shoes don't go with gray slacks. And the son says, that's what happens when you try to store a gigabyte of life on a 125K hard drive. And the dad is singing the theme song from the Beverly Hillbillies, if you remember that, way back when. Now, I know, you're a terrible memorizer. You're not that smart. You don't have time or the energy to do this on top of everything else you're doing. But you know what? Those are deceptions. Those are deceptions you would be able to effectively counter if you were already doing what I'm asking you to do. Can you do this? You know, when I was a teenager... I knew every starting player on every Major League Baseball team. I knew what positions they played, what other teams they'd played for, and roughly how well they were doing, batting average, ERA, that sort of thing. Fifteen years later, so I was in my 30s, there was a local pizzeria owned by a baseball player, a former baseball player, and the tables were covered with baseball cards from that era. And I still knew almost all of them. (laughs) <laughs> how many song lyrics do you know or sports statistics or passwords for your computer right don't lie to yourself everyone can memorize scripture now other people might be better at it than you but so what it's not a competition everybody can memorize scripture and i'm even going to show you how today i promised you some application here we go step one find a verse that you want to memorize and write it down. You can do that, right? Anybody here think they can't do this? Okay. I didn't think you'd raise your hand. If you are doubting, trust me, you can do this. Find a verse you want to memorize. Write it down. Now, you can use a business card like I handed out today. Did that thing go around? That bin? It didn't get to the middle? Where is it? Oh, it made it to the coffee bar. So. <laughs> It was thirsty. (laughs) You can send it down the middle and then back up the other side over here. And what about the sign-up sheets for Right Now Media? Did that get to everybody? Okay. Well, if you didn't get that, then you can find it after the service. So you can use a blank business card. You can use somebody else's business card. People hand them to me all the time. If I don't want them, they make good little notepads, right? You can use a post-it note, an index card, a scrap of paper. It doesn't matter. Just find a verse you like and write it down. Step two, carry that paper with you all the time. And whenever you have a minute, 
Practice your verse. Now, this could be while you're at a red light, while you're brushing your teeth, while you're waiting for your computer to boot up. There's lots of these little one-minute moments in your day. Practice your verse and its address reference, right? You can do this. Now, if you're alone, you might want to say the verse out loud because speaking it and hearing it will help you remember it. And once a day, I'd recommend writing it again on a piece of paper or typing it because that also will help you remember it. And if you're aggressive or if you drew the card from the bin that had two verses on it, well, then memorize, or two sentences, memorize the first sentence and then work on the second sentence. Steps one and step two, pretty easy. Step three, repeat step two every day for a week and you will know the verse by the end of that week. And then keep your card and just pull it out once or twice a week for the next couple of weeks to solidify it in your mind. This is how easy it is. Three easy steps. And you can do them. And if you do them, you can memorize scripture. If you want to get even more out of this exercise, we'll add step four, which is to reflect. To take five to ten minutes each day to prayerfully reflect or think about that scripture, that verse. If you do this, you might be surprised at what God brings to your mind. The first time I was challenged to do this, I was in my 30s. It was before, just before Leanne and I got married, a couple of years. It wasn't about memorization in that church. It was just the reflection. And I thought, well, okay, I'll try this. So I was reading a chapter of the Bible a day, I think, at that time. So I read my chapter, and then I would go sit outside in my flower gardens and just let my mind float and see what God brought to mind. And you know, I was amazed. I mean, I came up with applications for my life. I came up with insights that I didn't get while I was reading it because now I was thinking about it, not just reading it. I came up with questions, things I didn't understand that maybe I should ask somebody. If you were looking at that second Timothy passage that we looked at earlier, you might ask yourself, what good work does God have planned for me? And you might pray about that. Or what does it mean to be equipped? And how can I get more equipped to do God's work? Am I dedicated to God? What does that mean in this verse? What does it look like to be dedicated to God? Does my lifestyle truly reflect dedication? Should I change something in my life to be more dedicated or more equipped or more involved in doing God's work? How could Scripture train me in righteousness? How does that work? How could it be useful in correcting my ways or in reproving me? And hey, what's the difference between correcting and reproving anyway? That's worth looking up. Is Scripture, if it is, in, if it is inspired by God, what does that imply for how important it is in my life? For how accurate it is? For how much I should value it. And if it has all that value, should I spend more time learning it? I mean, there are a lot more ways that you could reflect just on this one verse, or two verses, one passage. This is just what I came up with one day sitting down to write the sermon. Or maybe God will prompt you to think about how you could use a verse to actually help somebody else. So you'd actually be out doing the work God has planned for you. Now, of course, you can do step four without doing the first three, right? If you want to reflect on a passage without memorizing it. In fact, I would suggest that you reflect on what you read in the Bible every single time you read something in the Bible. If you have 10 minutes, read five, reflect five. That's a pretty good way to do it. But I was thinking for the next few weeks, maybe you should give all four steps a try. Me too. Okay? I've gotten out of the habit of memorizing scripture. Memorize one verse per week. Spend a few minutes reflecting on it every day. And we'll see what happens. What do you say? Maybe from now to the end of October? You give this a try? When I led a small group of teenage boys, I started giving them devotions. Some of you get similar devotions here. If you've asked for them, we email them to you. Because I wanted them to have daily times of prayer and study and memorization and reflection. 
Now, you remember that boy I said who was upset because the Holy Spirit brought that verse to mind and curbed his lust at the gym? Let's call him Bruce. Bruce had two little sisters from his father's second marriage. And Bruce, when I met him, had a jealous hatred for those girls. He visibly acted out animosity toward them and spoke animosity about them. But then he started doing those devotions and coming to our group. And by the end of the year, Bruce was praying for his sisters regularly. And even asking other guys in the group to pray for specific needs of his little sisters. And he was finding love for them in his heart, even though he still kind of resented their existence a little bit in the home. He was going down the path of following Christ. This stuff works. The carrot is real. The next year, I started seminary. So I stepped out of youth ministry. God brought two men, both more equipped than I am, to lead that group. But Bruce was hurt that I left. His parents weren't much help to keep him growing spiritually, and now his mentor had abandoned him in his eyes So he left the group, and later he left the church, and later he stopped walking down the path of Christ in the light and started walking in the ways of the world. The stick is real also. A couple of years before we started doing youth ministry, Leanne and I each experienced a pronounced depression, one after the other. It was weird. But one aspect of the cure for us was to memorize and reflect on key passages of the Bible which countered the negative thoughts we had in our heads and gave us encouragement and hope. The main reason I am more equipped than you today to stand up here and be the pastor is because I have spent more time in God's Word. I'm not a superhero, I still struggle with sin. But I have studied that Bible thousands and thousands of hours over the last couple of decades. And I still study it all the time. Now, you might not aspire to be a pastor, so who cares, right? But whatever God has for you, you're going to struggle to become it. You're going to struggle to be able to do it unless you allow God to heal you, strengthen you, grow you, transform you, equip you through the revelation in His word of the Bible. If every day you would invest five minutes for reflection, plus another five broken into little tiny pieces for memorization, then you could accomplish a lot towards ensuring your spiritual growth, preserving your spiritual health, protecting yourself from deception, temptation, wrong decisions, and being ready for whatever God has for you. Ten minutes a day. Can you do it? I hope you'll give it a try. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for what you have revealed in the Bible. And we thank you that you are gracious and merciful. And even if we're coming here today and we have not studied our Bible for months and we don't even know where it is or it's just sitting on our coffee table trying to convince everyone who comes in that we do study the Bible, (laughs) whatever is going on in our lives, Lord, you are ready to forgive us and cleanse us and help us. So we pray for your encouragement. May the Holy Spirit encourage us to try getting into your word. And may the Holy Spirit use your word as we memorize it and reflect on it to bring about real growth and healing and change We want to be strong people of faith. We want to be people that others can look to for help in their times of need, even though we're not afraid to ask for help in our times of need. Lord, help us to encourage one another in this. Give us the courage to try memorizing again if we have stopped or never started. And let us try a little reflection. And we pray that you would reward us Not with ice cream with the pastor, perhaps, but with insight 
spiritual insight and all that that brings. We love you. We thank you. We look forward to knowing you better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.